You are listening to the Two and Out CFL Podcast, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. Week 7 of the CFL season is in the books. It might be the most physically intense season uh, or week of the season so far and uh, maybe the most officiating botches of the season uh, so far. But Sheldon, uh, this heat's wearing on me, man. I want to ask you, your least favorite month of the year, not just this year, just every single year, because I think this month has taught me what my least favorite month is. <laughs> If I didn't have CFL football to attend, it would be the entire summer. I hate the heat. Like, I, I want to move to Antarctica right now. This I, is wearing on me, man. I, I'm, I'm struggling. Yeah. And yesterday, the smoke finally came. Oh, yeah. Like, we've been, we've been pretty lucky here in Regina without having too much smoke, but it's disgusting out right now. And yeah i went i did the stadnik uh, invitational on saturday no yeah saturday and it was fun but I, like at 9 30 in the morning it already felt like it was 31 out and Ooh, how got, was it overall like how was your golf game looking like i'm a joke on the course so uh i i, I won't well, make fun of you <laughs> well i didn't get last so that oh. is wonderful i got second last <laughs> Uh, the only person better than or worse than me was Boosh, uh, okay. but uh, plus fifty four, plus fifty four is what I shot. Um, I'm pretty sure that would be probably the front six for me. So I think you did all right. <laughs> well, we we picked up a few balls when it got to double, okay. double par or whatever, but. I, I didn't lose as many balls as I thought I was going to, but like just the heat was ridiculous. It was sweaty. It was gross. It, but it was so fun. Like and we and we raised over twenty six hundred dollars for this CFL fans fight cancer That's with amazing. all the sponsorship and everything. Yeah, it was it was incredible. That is amazing. Well done, CFL fans. And uh, it seems like the Stadnik Invitational is getting bigger and bigger <laughs> every it's, year. That, that's it's sweet, apparently. Man. It's apparently going to be even bigger if we can if we can figure out what Joe and Dave are trying to figure out. Next year will be pretty crazy. That is awesome. Yeah, I, I was thinking in my head, like, I, I don't like July. So I, I'm wondering, like, in the in the spirit of McLeod Bethel Thompson's player safety, if each team could play two games a week in October and get rid of these hot weather games... Or we could start the season Labor Day and have the Grey Cup in March or April or something like that. I think I would be totally down with that. <laughs> yeah, if we didn't have to compete with that, you know, NFL the whole season <laughs> long. Uh, but I would be here for that. I'd be here for a, a you know, a, a, whole, a, a Western semifinal in, in March in, in Mosaic Stadium. Let's go. I'm in too. I'm totally in. Now, uh, the first game of the week, it was a Friday night doubleheader as the Ottawa Red Blacks beating the Edmonton Elks 20 to 14. Uh, kind of an ugly game. These two teams playing back to back. Um, neither offense could really get going. Like, uh, it was actually the first drive of the game where Drew Brown took the Edmonton Elks or the Red Blacks down the field and scored that touchdown. And I kind of wondered, ooh, is this going to be an ugly one uh, for the Elks? I mean, to their credit, their defense played well. But then McLeod Bethel Thompson probably had his weakest game of the season. But... In the first half, they put in Trey Ford for two series and didn't really seem to, at least I think, take advantage of what Trey is really good at. It was two two and outs. Then they put McLeod back in. So I think neither quarterback really had a chance to get into a rhythm. And I, I think that was detrimental to their offense in this game. Yeah, I think it's it's okay. I think it's a good idea for them to have a package for Trey and to to use it as a change up. But when you're not going to use it as a change up, all that is going to do is frustrate your your starting quarterback. Who, let's face it, was very frustrated after the game. Yeah, uh, and like it just didn't work, and that's that was not a, a that was not setting them up for success. Uh, 
maybe it was just because it was too short of a week that maybe you you wait till the next game after to try to figure out this Trey Ford package because uh, I could see it. You know, if you if you if you have a series where you move the ball a little bit, but you just you stall out, then the next series you can come in and and you run an option style, run like use Trey Ford to the best of his abilities, and then go back to McLeod once the other team figures out what they're doing with with Trey. But sometimes two quarterback systems work, sometimes they do not. Uh, this did not, so it's back to the drawing board for Jerry's Jacks. Yeah, it was. Uh... It almost felt almost kind of forced. Like, I, I almost kind of wondered if they were going to stick with Trey the rest of the game and maybe they, you know, gave everybody a, a curveball. But it was just, yeah, two series and then he was out the rest of the game and the Elks offense couldn't really get anything going. I think the D-lines of both teams overmatched the opposing offensive line and that caused a lot of the issues in this game. But uh, Ottawa, yeah. they tried to get Pimpleton... You know, involved again, uh, trying to have a repeat of his performance from week six against the Elks. And he had a wide open touchdown uh, that he ended up uh, letting hit the carpet. He dropped that one, but he still had five catches for 56 yards. Clearly a dynamic receiver that teams are going to have to game plan for uh, the rest of the season. But even the Red Blacks couldn't really get the rushing attack going consistently, even though Raquel Armstead did have another touchdown. He only had 12 carries for 53 yards. As for Kevin Brown uh, of the Elks, nine carries, 26 yards, 2.9 yards a carry. Uh, the leading receiver for the Elks was actually uh, Eugenio Lewis, Seven catches on 12 targets for 74 yards. He should be the leading receiver. No surprise there. But some of the calls in this game, and I think it's a theme probably for most of the week. I don't know if everybody's cooked from the heat, but late in the game, Dominic Rimes got called for an offensive pass interference. Early in the game, I thought one of his big catches, it was a clear push-off. Like, the full extension, no call on that one. And what I've noticed, some of these premier receivers in the league, they're pretty good at drawing pass interferences. There was a moment where Geno kind of pulled the DB and then fell down, and there was no call on that. It's just we need consistency. Sometimes yeah. there's the phantom calls where nothing happens and it gets called. And then where there's something egregious, it, it doesn't get called. And uh, the, the, both Friday night games, they had some, had some issues there uh, when it came to those calls. Yeah, uh, it, it, they need to find a way to get it consistent. But how are you going to be consistent when it's part-time employees who are only working weekends and where do they have time to do film study like they should be full-time employees during the season i think that's the way to go um but other outside of that and i don't want games going four hours long but if there is a call that is terrible and you can tell it's terrible the eye in the sky should be there to be like, nah, guys, pick up that flag. That was terrible. Like, like there was one uh, in the Ryder game that we'll talk about, but like where he ran, the receiver ran in, like they just hit each other and he fell down and, and, and the back judge, like 40 yards away is the guy who yeah. throws the flag. And because maybe from his perspective, maybe he thought that the guy got pushed over, but it wasn't. There was no pass interference. Yes, it benefited my team, whatever, I don't care. But the eye in the sky should have been like called down and be like, no, pick up that flag because it wasn't interference. It wasn't even incidental interference. It was just two guys that, you know, one fell over. So I don't know how to get it consistent, but it needs to be because it's it's a really bad look for the league when when you go on Twitter after every game and all it is is people upset about officiating instead yeah, of yeah. being happy about the games and being yeah. excited about their team winning even i like yeah we won it's awesome we're in first place but there was a few calls that extended drives that shouldn't have been and I, it's hard for me to take solace in that yeah uh, there was a pretty soft P.I. on Edmonton in the first uh, half. Now, I hear this discussion in hockey 
like sometimes the veteran players get the benefit of the doubt and they get the call. Do you think that's a thing? Yes, <laughs> in, I in do. Football, like some of the well, the players, it, it's part of gamesmanship. You know, the coaches are in the refs' ear. Like, watch mm-hmm. for this. Watch this guy on the next play. Get him next time. And sometimes I wonder if Edmonton does end up on the wrong side of those. <laughs> uh, at least maybe it feels like it because now they've got 10 losses in a row dating back to last season. Yeah, it seem, it, it seems like that could be the case. But I do think there are certain players that do get a little bit of a – maybe a little bit of a softer call on them. Uh, I'm going to say Zach Caleros. There's been some roughing the passers that wouldn't be roughing the passers if, you know, if Vernon Adams got hit like that, I don't think. But um, – I, I, they need to call the infraction and not with the player that it happens to. And it, it's tough because you see some players get hit in the head or they get hurt. And then maybe the ref is like, oh, we can't let this guy get hurt, get hit too hard. So maybe, you know, you throw a flag for a little bit less to try to get it so that the players don't hit him. But uh, yeah, it, it's frustrating. There needs to be there needs to be accountability from the league. There needs to be the league coming out and being like, Hey, these calls were missed. We can't change the outcomes of the games, but these calls are missed. We're going to, we're going to talk to our officiating crews. We are going to, you know, do some study. We're going to show them some scenarios and we're going to make it so that they understand and recognize what is a penalty and what's not a penalty. And I know that these guys didn't forget what a penalty is. And I know that to get to the CFL, they've been refing for years and years. But it's the biggest game in the country. It's professional. And, you know, if too many players get bad calls against them, then maybe their coaches will think that they're getting penalties too much. And, you know, they may lose their job. So uh, I think they have to figure out a way to f- to fix it for sure. But they're never going to be perfect. Yeah, nobody's perfect. And I, I, I do think it is important to keep the... Uh, uh, human element in the game as well sometimes I I get annoyed with certain things like in hockey challenging a offside where you know half a millimeter of a guy's skate is still on the blue line or a guy's fingernail is uh, you know less than a yard <laughs> you get called offside like it, some stuff like that baseball it, part of the gamesmanship is the catcher framing you know uh, and, and making a ball look like a strike on those close calls. So there is a lot of human element, and we try to, you know, for lack of a better term, cheat sometimes <laughs> when it comes to this stuff. But uh, I think the spotlight in Edmonton currently, it's on their kicker. And <laughs> over the past few years, they've lost some good kickers, whether it's ratio or not wanting to pay them what uh, the kickers believe they're worth, but Sergio Castillo, Sean White, who's currently on uh, north of 40 consecutive field goals, um, and Boris Beatty, but what's the issue there? Now, I'll acknowledge that the wind at TD Place in Ottawa was causing some problems uh, in this game, and sometimes... uh, I think the wind causes more problems than even we see, whether it's uh, deep sure. passes or things like that. Um, but four of seven on field goals, I think he's 62% on the year. Um, last year, he had the best percentage field goal wise in the CFL. Um, this comes, uh, you know, five days after. A mistake on a kickoff that ended up being an illegal kickoff and maybe caused them the game against Ottawa. Beatty's having problems <laughs> right now with the Elks, and I'm assuming he got a pretty healthy paycheck, and it's not going well for him. And uh, you see what some of the other teams have, especially comparatively, right? Yeah, and and I do think it's tough because. The kicker is is probably the most mentally tough position in the game, just because, like, it's 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 muscle memory. They they know how to kick a ball. They kick the ball the exact same every time, but it's mental. Yeah. So whatever is happening in Boris's head 
is what's impacting his kicking. Uh, so yeah, they, he needs to find a way to clear his head. He needs to get, just get back to basics. Uh, maybe he was thinking too much about that previous game and the kick that went out of bounds. Uh, but honestly, you would think that that would make him a little bit more motivated to have a better game and to have a bounce back. Uh, so but we, we've seen kickers, we've seen Brett Lowther in, in Saskatchewan go through phases. We've seen Sergio Castillo has gone through phases, and he's he's one of the he's definitely the best long ball kicker, I guess I would say. Uh, the only few that haven't gone through phases in the last little bit is like Sean White and Renee Paredes. Uh, and I think this year the kicking is actually quite good compared to last year. Um, and so that's that's quite troubling when you know the best guy from last year is is kicking the worst right now. Yeah, that, that's quite interesting. Uh, sometimes, you know, the change of scenery is good for players, but the change of scenery just hasn't worked out uh, for Boris this year so far. Um, Drew Brown, he had a couple interceptions, uh, 22 of 33, 257 yards. It, it wasn't a pretty game by any means. The leading receiver for the Red Blacks was Justin Hardy, five catches for 61 yards. Um, but th- the defense is really overmatched, uh, you know, kind of both offenses in this one. And I, I think the big conversation is, yeah, you mentioned it. What happened after the game where McLeod Bethel Thompson, wow. And he's kind of sounded off on this before, um, saying that it's disgusting pretty strong words that he used about the schedule. Now, at least it's both teams in the same situation instead of them playing a team off the bye. But we did see three players go down in this one, including two for the Elks. Sam Achimpong gets carted off the field. Scott Hutter gets hurt. Uh, Tobias Harris got hurt for the Red Blacks, which is their second returner in two weeks. I don't know if Harris is going to be out long term, but Achimpong, the cart came out. Um, Scott Hutter, uh, he can he confirmed it. I think on Monday that this that the in, or the injury is season ending. Um, I don't know if the the shorter week contributes to that, but definitely less preparation with uh, maybe one and a half practices between these games. And maybe that, you know, contributed to the offense struggling and maybe those injuries as well. Yeah, uh, it's not the first time this season that this has happened to teams, though, because the Riders and the Ticats had this happen to them as well. Uh, so I think at least it looks like the CFL, when they've had to go to these short weeks, like extreme short weeks, they've done it back to backs at least so far. I haven't looked at the schedule to see if it happens again, but at least when it's the same team, like you said, you have less prep. You, you've you already gone through your prep, with, so you just have to change a few things. You already know what team you're playing with, so you don't really have to worry about... I think you probably can get away with one or two less practices there, but when it comes to recovery time, I can understand being upset uh, about injuries that can happen, but I never heard a single rider player do this. I never heard a single tie cat player you sound off like this uh and and i get it he's 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 the leader he wants to stand up for his his guys the other thing in his thing is he 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 made it very clear he wasn't happy about what the trey ford thing was like he was very clear about that um so is this so much player safety or is this a guy who's 0 and 6 and he's getting really really frustrated and it's reaching a boiling point and he's trying to find something maybe he's using this as, as a way to motivate his team you know i'm going to put my neck out on the line i'm going to get fined uh just to kind of show his team that he's pissed off and that he something needs to change and if that's the case good for him um but you, you just got to be careful you don't want to be labeled as that guy who's just a whiner right uh so hopefully for the elks if this was what he was trying to do and motivate his team then it works um but i just i hope it's not a day a weekly occurrence that he's just going to be sounding off on 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 issues just because he's upset 
you know, historically, uh, the Labor Day games, uh, I think Hamilton and Toronto and uh, Calgary, Edmonton always had the shorter turnaround, uh, always. Like, sometimes they would play on Monday and then Friday, which is a bit yeah. crazy. Um, but I'm looking at it this year, just in a few weeks here, August 4th, the Argos are in Calgary, and then August 9th, uh, the Stamps are in Toronto. So it's uh, a Sunday and a Friday, the same situation that just happened between Ottawa and uh, Edmonton. So that's just one example. There probably is a couple more this year, but they're trying. Like if they need to have a short week, that those teams are actually both dealing with it at the okay. same time. Now, I mentioned off the top of the show that the intensity was at an all time high uh, for week seven. Normally, uh, we got to wait till Labor Day for this kind of stuff to happen. The geographical rivals playing against each other. The insults just uh, feel a little bit more personal. They cut a little bit deeper. And the Riders beat the Bombers 19-9. to Now, the low-scoring affair, <laughs> but this is kind of par for the course when these teams play, other than a few banjo bowl blowouts that the Bombers have over the Riders. Every other time they play, it's like every little play matters. Every second down matters. And you got to fight for every single yard. And that was no different in uh, this one with the Riders uh, pulling out a big victory over the Bombers. Now, this goes a long way to the Riders uh, securing a home playoff date. And... The Bombers being in an absolute battle with the Stampeders <laughs> to, to sneak into the playoffs. That's kind of what it looks like right now. The, the Riders and the Bombers are going to play back-to-back in early September. And all the Riders need to do is win one of those. And then it looks like their ticket is all but punched to a home playoff game. As for the Bombers, they split with Calgary already. And Calgary, after beating BC, we'll get to that game, obviously. They are a tough test. They're well coached this year, and they're going to be tough to uh, uh, beat down the stretch here, I think. They're only going to get better. But the Bombers could miss the playoffs. And that that brings a whole lot more questions. But maybe we'll try to save that. (laughs) For for after the game, because at halftime here, it was 6-6. Six, six. Uh, it was clearly a struggle. Um, but the, the refs were struggling in this one, too. There were only 11 penalties combined between the teams, uh, but 131 yards between the teams uh, combined. But some of them were just like, why are you throwing the flag there? Yep, it was it was bad. There were some missed calls too that that should have been penalties that I think that they didn't throw. Um, but it it felt like a playoff game, and uh, like it 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 was weird. It did not feel to me at all like a Labor Day Classic game. It felt like a playoff game. It felt like it felt like it was must win, and it was just it was like a chess match, and they were going shot for shot, shot for shot, and then like you said, a couple admittedly bad penalty calls extended a few rider drives and uh i'm not saying that's the difference i'm not saying that's why the riders won because it's not um but it it, it kind of deflates the feeling of the mm-hmm. win a little bit uh but it was it was a great game i thought other outside of those those penalty calls uh it was tough it was physical it was uh you know there could have been some some highlight plays there was some big drops that didn't that could have been big plays uh the when the riders they lost one of their best receivers in Ken Schaefer Baker but then a Joe Joe comes in and you know has his first 100 yard game as a pro and it was just I love that guy, man. <laughs> hey, he I, might be the steal of the draft, no? Like there was a lot yeah. of talk about his attitude and that seemed to be the biggest hesitation with teams. And that is kind of the talk why he didn't get an opportunity 
uh, down south. Now mm-hmm. he's still he's 22 years old. Like yeah. he's going to turn 23 in January, but for a seventh round pick, if the riders keep him around, like he almost seems to me, even if Schaefer Baker is healthy, that they need to find a way to have him on the field all the time. Oh, I think he's definitely like, he's outplayed Picton. I think Picton has been a really good, like second down option, but in this game, I don't even think Shea threw to Picton once. No. Um, but like, I, I think if, if, if Schaefer Baker is healthy, you, you definitely have to find a way to keep this kid on the field. And it's not even just his, his receiving that is amazing. He is an incredible blocker. A lot of the, the big, like the, the couple last week where Emilis had the big, big catches and runs, a Joe, Joe was out there blocking for it. And and it, it just his attitude. He's he's giving it all in special teams. He's giving it all in blocking. It's showing that he he obviously took to heart what the coaches and what people were saying about him that he doesn't have a good attitude. That he's lazy. Um, and it's interesting because it kind of came out this week or maybe the week before that he was a roommate of Corey Mace's younger brother down in Florida oh, when wow. he was down there for football. So so Corey is actually known. I, I wouldn't say known him like really well but known of him obviously from his brother for quite some time so maybe he maybe that's another reason why they drafted him and took a chance on him because of that you know relationship that was building there but you know what Schaefer Baker a fourth round pick uh Adjo Adjo a seventh round pick and I I think everybody all CFL fans agree they're they're both first round talents uh, so yeah. th- those are some good picks that the riders have made uh, over the years. Now, uh, in the second half, that's when uh, <laughs> things definitely got interesting in uh, this one. And I think that rider fans need to be really encouraged here because even if Harris is healthy, uh, Trevor Harris, it's been a while since the riders have had two quarterbacks that they can trust. And I think that's a pretty good takeaway uh, from Shea Patterson's performance in the three games that he started. There's <laughs> In Saskatchewan, there's been a big drop-off between the number one and the number two. And Patterson he had no turnovers in this one. He outplayed Kolaris in this one. Uh, 17 to 25, 261 yards and a touchdown. Like, it's not like he threw for 375 and four touchdowns or whatever, but not turning the ball over and him being the number two, it seems like teams need more than one guy that they can rely on to sling the yep. ball, and now the Riders have that. For sure, and, and, and he's improving every game. His decision-making is improving. His pocket presence is improving. Uh, his his trust of his O-line. Like, and and let's let's talk about uh, Brammer. Is that his name? The guy who took over or who's playing in, instead of Yoshi didn't even say his name once, and he was going against Willie Jefferson. That's pretty damn impressive. Uh, so I was extremely happy with that. Um, but, like... Shea is I'm not ready to call him the next guy but he's if he continues to improve like this you can let Trevor Harris wait a few more weeks to get really really healthy if if the riders dropped you know the game against Toronto and the game against Winnipeg and now you know we're getting we're we're only at three wins then you might get the panic time and you might put Trevor Harris back in there a little bit too soon but I think now you have the benefit to just let Harris get healthy until heck even Labor Day like if Shea's gonna keep going you might as well ride with the hot hand I'm not saying he should take over for Trevor Harris but it's it's quite the security blanket so the riders touchdown drive there was only one touchdown drive in this one uh, came i believe it was the third quarter and uh adjo adjo had two catches on the drive 31 yards on the drive and it ended with a pretty nice play 
at uh, Ratkovich, the uh, uh, other running back that the Riders had on the roster here, and that put them in the lead, 13-6. to And then on the next drive, Zach ends up throwing an interception, kind of forcing it in there. Now, they were using Zach, I, I think... Uh, at times, in a way that we were used to seeing him play, like moving the ball around. But in the past, when Zach would move the pocket and run to the sideline, he had guys that were able to get open. There were Schoen and Lawler. Now those guys aren't able to get open, and he forced the ball uh, a few times, and Eau Claire came up with the interception, but Zach shouldn't have thrown that ball. Uh, they were in great field position there to at least come yeah. away with some points. And Zach made a bad decision. And at times, at least watching on TV, it looks like he's in he's in some pain. Like he's yeah. he's hurting. And I think we saw that in the BC Calgary game as well. Uh, he, he's not 100% healthy out there. But uh, forcing the ball and making poor decisions, uh, it, it seems like they're getting desperate and making some mistakes we're not used to seeing them make yeah well and i think he's running around a little bit more not by design this year just because of the lack of uh strength of the o-line uh like stanley bryant was a game time decision but he we've talked about it he's lost a step he's he's not the same you know perennial most outstanding lineman nominee from the bombers so uh, i think I think Zach is feeling the pressure of the pocket collapsing around him and he feels like he has to get out there. And and I feel like he feels that he has to force balls in there just because of what you said. He doesn't have that reliability, so he feels he needs to, you know, actually th- force the ball into places it shouldn't be. Um, but I was kind of surprised they didn't go with a Strevler package just as a tra- change of pace because he was struggling. Um, but as we were going to talk about next year, it almost seemed like it was going to, the comeback was going to work. Well, it's 16, nine Saskatchewan late in the fourth quarter. It's right around the three minute warning. And Zach makes a nice completion and Nick Dembski 50 yard completion. They get down to the 15. Jameer Thorman forces a fumble. Marcus sales picks it up and it's rider ball. So it's not all Zach, and I think we've seen a few plays from Dembski where he's turned the ball over, and uh, those fumbles, <laughs> they're crushing, man. That, that'll that uh, turn the tide. Like, Winnipeg had a real chance uh, to tie the game up there, and of course, lots of time for the Riders to answer back after that one. But man, a critical fumble after a huge game gain, and that hurts even more after you you know gain half the field and then put the ball on the ground. That's almost a bit worse than you know <laughs> having a seven yard gain and fumbling it there. Yeah, and and it's it's surprising because, like you said, that has happened to Dembski quite a bit, but not usually against the Riders. He's been a mm. Rider killer ever since he's left, uh, and so that's why as soon as I saw that him running, I was just like, "Oh, you got to be kidding me! Not again!" And then the fumble happened, and I damn near lost my voice because <laughs> I was just going crazy. <laughs> it like the 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 low to the high just in that. 10 seconds is just unreal and uh, I love football well and then we got to talk about the final play of the game it's 19-9 riders I'm going to play (laughs) the play here right now five seconds left Shea Patterson takes the snap time expires and he continues to run around for two seconds and then Adam Big Hill makes the hit with time expired, lands on him, and uh, a minor melee ensues. <laughs> and unfortunately, we have to wait until Labor Day for these two teams to play again. But Sheldon, you were pretty fired up uh, after this play. I'll say this first. To me, it looked like the Riders dared Big Hill to make that hit, and he took the bait. I think uh, kind of both players... <laughs> We're wrong in this situation. Now, unfortunately, uh, the discourse on X 
has devolved into almost a uh, political battle with uh, people throwing out words like victim blaming, like uh, <laughs> like Big Hill took him out, you know, in the back alley and uh, really assaulted him before stealing his Slurpee money. But man, <laughs> hey. We saw it at the end of the Calgary BC game. Calgary up by one. Mayor takes the snap and instantly throws it away. Oh, yes. It okay, almost so. looked to me like the riders were taunting Winnipeg a little bit. And those. Any defender on any team doesn't handle that well. <laughs> I, I hear you. But all I'm going to say is yes, I was very fired up. I've cooled down a little bit. I think the only thing that I don't like about it is him landing on him. Yeah, I that's think that she, and even if the game was still on, that probably gets him the flag. But the timing yeah. of the hit and all that, there's, it's but the landing. Yeah, it's the it's it's the landing. So it's the last ten percent of that play is what I have a problem with. But I agree that Shea held on to the ball too long. But if if you watch and and we were just able to see it there, like the difference between the Calgary play and this play and what a lot of people are saying, Oh, you should have just knelt it. There was five seconds that they had to clear off. There's zero chance that Jefferson and big Hill are going to let Shea stand there for five seconds to kneel the ball. Right. I think everyone can agree with that. We've seen when kneeling situations happen, the rushes, the rush ends still come in and tr- because it's football, they're playing to the final whistle. Okay. So in Mayer's situation, yeah, he took five steps back and he chucked it. Because it was only three seconds, five seconds. Like I know it's only two more seconds, but but I think I think Patterson. I think that's what Patterson was going to do. I think if the Riders were going to taunt them, like they could have just went for a field goal and ran up the score, but they didn't. But I don't think that is because they need the points. You know what I mean? I I know they but, played yeah. three times, so yeah. maybe that. But why not punt? Well, because it would have been like that. You're on your thirty-eight. It was a thirty-eight yard line. Well, wow. that was a field position. Like the, I think the what they should have done air for, you know, four seconds. Well, uh, but uh, maybe I think they should have lined up as a punt and then the punter could have ran around for a yeah, few seconds and, like and sat better. down. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think, and I think we've seen Mark Mueller is going hundreds of yeah. times. And I think, I don't know where you're going, but I think it's a case of inexperienced coaches and quarterbacks combined. Yeah. 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 So I was going to say, I think that Shea Patterson, Corey Mace, and Mark Mueller are all going to learn from this. And I like that Shea Patterson took the high road Mm -hmm. after the game. I do like, even because I I don't think that's how he actually feels. Because he said to the camera, (laughs) Big Hill, that hurt. Like, he's like, Big, you hurt me. But he was kind of, I don't know, it kind of felt. The way he said it, fun. He was like, Biggie, you didn't of, need yeah. to do no, that. That hurt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, and, and I think the most important thing out of all of this, he wasn't hurt. Yeah. If he was hurt, if he had, you know, three cracked ribs and he's he's out and then the riders are down to Jack Jake Cohn for the next two games, I think that is a lot worse. Um, but all, like, it just, I think... Hopefully everyone learns from this, and I want Adam Big Hill to learn from this too. I get that he's he's a, he's the type of player who plays to the limit and just over it. I, I think everyone can agree with that. I'm not saying he's a dirty player, but he plays over the limit. He he's launching like his head with like a spear every time <laughs> there's a third and one, right? So like I think. I think what happened was Shea just got scared or not scared, but I think he didn't expect the rush to be that quick because Willie Jefferson was right in his face. If you watch behind right? him, like Willie dives and Shea is kind of like, yeah, Whoa. he's kind of like, what the heck? <laughs> and, and I then, think so maybe I think, that distracted him. I don't know. Yeah. And I think that's probably where he would have thrown the ball because that's when it got to zeros on yeah. the clock. So again, I'm not, I don't think Big Hill should be suspended. I know in our group chat I said that he was a POS and, and a dirty like, but I think maybe a little bit of a fine just for the landing on. He might get like fine. I think you have yeah. to. I think you have to send a message that you can't do that. Like you, the hit was fine. Shea Patterson 
was live game there. He deserved to get hit, and but Big Hill could have just popped him, and that would have been it. And then if Big Hill pops him there, the riders don't get upset at that. Right. They only got upset at that because he landed on him. And uh, it was actually really interesting because I know that they're both on the PA. Uh, I saw Low- <laughs> Lowther went right to Big Hill oh, to try oh, to I get him that. out of there. Yeah. The so kicker. I thought that was quite interesting. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, wait, cooler heads prevail. <laughs> like, it's not yeah. even worth getting into the online stuff like it's it's crazy no. like uh, but everybody sees it yeah. through the, the the green drunk goggles like Adam yeah. Big Hill's a hall of famer he's not a piece of crap like come on like some of the language well, being used yeah it's no crazy. I, I know I know and and like I said it's it's heat of the moment too I I admit I'm a very passionate fan and sometimes I will react passionately when maybe <laughs> an hour afterwards or when i see a replay i'll i'll calm down and and i'll always admit that i'm wrong or you that do, i've seen it differently <laughs> uh but it's just i that's part of what i love this game so much i love getting fired up like that i love i love you know bleeding green but at the same time i don't want players getting hurt and i think i'm just gonna say this Big Hill or anybody landing on another quarter like that is is worse for player safety than what McLeod Bethel Thompson is talking about, in my opinion. Stuff That's like this only happens in Saskatchewan Winnipeg games, though, you know? Like, it's... What? Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the intensity is just way up here. And, 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 and we love that, though. We yeah, love rivalries yeah. like that, right? It's just, I, I, I'm just glad that Shea didn't get hurt. That's that's the main thing, uh, and it's going to make Labor Day even more intense. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they're going to be they're going to have that, that hype video and everything. Hundred <laughs> percent. Now speaking of rivalries, the Hamilton Tiger Cats getting their first win of the season by beating the Argos 27-24. <laughs> now this is. I want to say props to the Tim Hortons Field faithful. I don't know if it was like it on everybody's TV, but they were fired up for the Argos coming into town. And they were fired up for the Ticats to get that first win of the season. And I believe they made a big difference in uh, that game. But now the big thing here is the Ticats blocking a punt early on. You know, almost the next play, James Butler runs it in for a nine-yard touchdown. And then the defense also forces a fumble and takes a field goal to the house. Now, Bo Levi Mitchell had been on pace to throw for 6,000 yards this season. In this game, 270 yards, 20 at 29, a touchdown and an interception. So he didn't have the flashiest game of the year but when the special teams and the defense are scoring that makes it a lot easier to come away with a victory but yeah and then that's that was the biggest thing that's what that's what i talked about last week that was the problem with the tie cats was it wasn't their offense it was their defense was not showing up their well, defense showed up <laughs> and the defense almost let it go look sure. it was close <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but that's momentum. Momentum can change things on a dime, and you know maybe you get a little too cocky. But like the defense showed out for fifty nine minutes of that game, and uh, like that's what Hamilton needed to get this monkey off their back and to get that first win. So the Ticats do enter the fourth quarter with a 17-point lead, and the Argos scored two touchdowns and got real close uh, to getting into field goal range <laughs> in uh, the One of them was quarter. a return, though, right? One What's of them that? was a generic grant. One of them was a was a generic grant touchdown. So yeah. that's not on the defense. Like that's on special teams. But Janarian does it again. Uh, yeah, like he, it's crazy. I, yeah, I had a text from my buddy Matt. Uh, is he better than Gizmo? Is he like? Is he this? Is this he? Is he this? This era's Gizmo. Okay, he's not better than Gizmo. Like it's Gizmo what, what, and then what, everybody else. Like Gizmo yeah, actually is uh, double. Yeah. He has more yeah. than double the return touchdowns than second. 
True. And then, yeah, no, that's true. Okay. I didn't mean it like that. I meant like, is he this, is he the that heir of Gizmo? I guess. Yeah. That's because, what I mean. uh, yeah. Giz, <laughs> he probably has 40 more that were called back on flags. Like, Oh, hundred percent. But Hey, if Janarian plays for 14 years, like Gizmo did and Janarian yeah. gets to, you know, 20 return touchdowns and he starts to flirt with those numbers a little bit. Like it's yeah. pretty crazy what he's doing. And earlier in yeah. the game, he gets tackled by Ante Litre by a dread. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He's carrying it around. Like I don't know what the plan was to reattach it. <laughs> but I haven't seen anything like that in a football game, man. <laughs> Yeah, it was weird. I was waiting for them to put wraps like some tape on it so he could sign the date. <laughs> like a football. Okay, now that's a great idea. I thought you yeah. were going to say they'll put it on ice, like, you know, a severed no, cone, no, no. and then reattach it. <laughs> no, no, no. Just, Do you just think a date. That. Okay, like he's got some impressive hair. Now it covers his whole back. Like, do you see a rule being changed where you can't drag the guy down by his hair, or is it continue to stay fair game? Because it almost is like a horse collar. Well, it almost is, and it can it could cause damage to the neck. But like, I'm pretty sure that's the player like taking that risk if he's going to choose to have hair like that. Like, yeah. I, and and I'm sure he's had those dreads for a long time with yeah. the length they are and and i'm sure that that that's his look and that's what he's comfortable with but uh i'm not sure if you could tuck them into a jersey i don't know how that would feel <laughs> um but like as far as i see it that's fair game like I, and I will say this, I don't think it would have hurt him having the dread pulled out because they're just sewn in. And like, I don't think it, it wasn't like his scalp was ripped out there. It looks uh, pretty intense. But <laughs> it does look pretty intense. <laughs> and I'm sure like the, it's not great for your neck to get yanked back like that. But again, he's he's choosing to give that option to the players. So I, I don't know if that's worthy of changing a rule or not. Yeah, now Litre has got long hair of his own, so I don't know. Labor Day, maybe they'll be <laughs> going for the hair. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> that was a wild moment in uh, this game. But the bottom line, now, I, do you think that they're going to consider getting Arbuckle into a game earlier than Toronto got him in? Like, Cameron and Dukes... Again, like how many quarterbacks look great off the bench and then they get the full week of preparation and it's like, eh, it's just kind of average. You know what I mean? So Arbuckle, he goes 8 of 14 for 118 yards, a touchdown and an interception. But, and again, maybe the Mark Washington, you know, zone at the end, letting Toronto, you know, kind of get back. But it almost came back to bite him. You know, but, as the game went on, but Nick did that against Toronto or against Saskatchewan yeah. too the week before. So, like when I think of Cameron Dukes now, I think of Nickelback figured you out because I think the defensive yeah. coordinators have figured him out. And so, if I was Ryan Dinwiddie, you know, you, you're coming off two losses in a row. You have that other douchebag who's going to be coming back in a few weeks. <laughs> Maybe it is time to to see what Arbuckle can do in a full game situation because are you going to keep Arbuckle Cameron Dukes and the other guy there when he comes back like that's 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 a lot of salary on the books I know the other guy's been paid a lot of money uh but I just think it's he's come in there he's made the, he's he's moved the offense he's scored points i know he threw a touch or an interception in this game too but arbuckle has shown coming off the bench that he's been a really good quarterback before in calgary in ryan dinwiddie's system so maybe that's maybe that was the issue with when he was in ottawa and edmonton yeah, like so maybe it's it's the Ryan Dinwiddie system that he's comfortable with and that he can excel in because he did well in Calgary. 
And yeah. that's when he, yeah. that's why he became the, the, the prized yeah. CFL next guy, right? So if I was Ryan Dinwiddie, you try to get out of a two game slump, just go to him. And if it doesn't work, then you still go, but you can still go back to Cam Dukes the same way. Well, I mean, Arbuckle comes into the game here about eight minutes left, and it's on the Toronto 11. And he takes them down the field for a 99 yard drive and puts them within 10. And then, you know, the Ty Cats kick off uh, to uh, Janarian Grant. He stores, scores the touchdown. Now they're within three. So, <laughs> and they had all the time in the world. Uh, the Ticat faithful ended up getting on the Argos and I think forcing a touchdown or a, sorry, a, a penalty at the end of the game there. And Hamilton got real lucky that that was called incidental pass interference because if that was a spot foul, it's a good chance this game goes overtime and we're talking completely different. So that's yeah. like the Ticats escaped by the skin of their teeth in this one. But uh, yeah, the, 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 what happened was eight seconds left on the 50, uh, the Argos take uh, uh, an offside penalty. So then the clock ran. And if that didn't happen, they also might have been able to get into field goal range and uh, but they, take an attempt. They declined the penalty, so that's why the clock ran, wasn't it? Uh, I think... The tie cats. The t- I'm kind of confused, yeah, honestly. Because I, because th- I think if the penalty is accepted, the clock should stop. I think that's how it's supposed to work. I, I, I'm gonna be honest. I didn't see the ending of the game because my stupid recording cut off oh. right when when Hamilton kicked back. You're right. Uh, it di- they did decline it, and that's why the clock ran. But yeah. So if they would have accepted the penalty, yeah. I'd, I don't know, but anyway, like, if it was yeah. incomplete or whatever, the clock would have stopped. Mm-hmm. So right, yeah. right. Anyway, the the Toronto had an opportunity to yeah, they for sure did <laughs> score seventeen unanswered and uh, <laughs> punish the Tie Cats into zero and six, but the Tie Cats made it happen. Uh, <laughs> they took though, away the Owen Bowl. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, Ticats Elks at Commonwealth Stadium uh, next Sunday. Uh, James Butler, 11 carries, 50 yards. Uh, the leading receiver was Tim White, five catches for 66 yards. But again, the, the Ticat offense wasn't super flashy. Uh, they they did what they had to do to get the win. As for the Argos, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different receivers. Uh, involved in this game. Kadeem Carey had 66 yards rushing on 11 carries. Pretty decent average. Uh, the leading receiver was actually DeMonte Coxey, his biggest game of the year. Uh, five catches for 87 yards. And Devaris Daniels with a ridiculous touchdown catch. And there was another ridiculous touchdown catch in the next game we are going to talk about. But again, Ticats Argos, we don't have to wait too long to see uh, how these teams play. And it was probably the best performance from the Ticats D-line giving uh, the Argos some fits in in that department and able to rush the quarterback. But, yeah, I'm very interested to see how Dinwiddie's going to manage the quarterbacks over the next few games. It just seemed like Arbuckle came in very relaxed, not much pressure, made it happen, and uh, got them within striking distance of tying this game up. Now, <laughs> two and out fan Darren Baker... <laughs> <laughs> is going to be all over Sheldon for this one because the Calgary Stampeders beat the BC Lions 25-24. In his words, the Stamps did what the Riders couldn't do and beat the Lions, so they should move up your power rankings. But man, I talked about Kolaris being in pain. I think VA's hurting. And the Stamps got to him early. They hit him early. And I think that really rattled 
uh, VA and pr- the whole Lions offense, honestly, uh, they really couldn't get into a rhythm at all. And there was a stretch there where VA didn't get sacked for, you know, three games. Seems like that protection has kind of dwindled a little bit. Yeah, uh, it was it was not a good day for VA. Uh, he he was running around like you could tell he felt the pressure and the and losing the pocket like quickly. Uh, there wasn't any of these designed rollouts that he was doing. It was just running for his life, chucking the ball, and you know some bad things happened there. Yeah. Uh, like I I don't think it's fair to 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 categorize him as good VA and bad VA anymore. I think he's proved that he is good VA now. Um, but it, you can't have perfect games all the time. So, uh, and it just seems like whatever it was, whether it was the heat, whether it was, I don't know if it's smoky in Calgary. I don't know if, uh, if it was just a trap game. Uh, I don't know what it was, but it sometimes at some points in this game, I was texting with my other buddy, Matt, uh, like, does any team want to win this game? <laughs> because it just seemed like just these mistakes were happening. And, and even like at the end there, when that fumble happened. <laughs> and we'll talk about the end because that got yeah. crazy. Like- <laughs> <laughs> but it just, it just seemed like the teams were giving the game away to each other for a while there. And it was, it's it just not the way that you thought that BC was going to go into Calgary. Because I think, I think Calgary hadn't beat BC since like 2019 before at this home. game. Yeah. Yeah. At home. And, and like Calgary at home used to be almost a sure thing. So that's well, kind of interesting. And all of those games and this one too were decided in the last three minutes. So <laughs> I don't know what's with the Lions and the Stamps playing at McMahon, but uh, like this one was a show at times, but then at other times, it's, What's happening? Like, the penalties were actually unbearable. Between the two teams, 23 penalties for three, no, 250 yards. And now the Stamps took 12 for 180 themselves. I don't know if anybody's got the time to look at a stat like this, but when somebody gives up 180 penalty yards and wins the game... (laughs) <laughs> now, barring other mutual brawlings and uh, disqualifications, I that's wild yeah. to me. I know Justin McInnes at halftime said he didn't care about the heat, but man, I, I really think that it was affecting the officials and it was affecting uh, the players as well, whether they want to admit it or not. Um, but even there was a moment late in the game well, I guess we'll have to get there where the Lions got called for holding in their own end zone, which didn't look like much of a hold, but it ended up being a safety because they took the penalty in the end zone. And that's not a challengeable play. But uh, Alexander Hollins, one catch for seven yards. Justin McKinnis, three for 55. And William Stanback, he had 7.1 yards of carry pretty uh, respectable numbers, but he only got nine carries. Uh, If we go to Calgary, Jake Mayer, 25 of 32, three touchdowns. He had himself a great game. And I think Stamps fans will admit, we just got to see some of that consistency uh, building up there. A lot of those are uh, yak yards. Like Vernon Adams Jr. throws two interceptions and was close to throwing more. They were really struggling with the screen against Calgary. Jake uh, excelled with the screen and those receivers getting the yak and making it happen after the catch. Uh, The leading receiver actually ended up being Jalen Philpott. uh, Six catches, 79 yards, a ridiculous touchdown. He had one carry for nine yards and that touchdown where he got the one foot down was incredible. Jalen says, Tyson can do it. I can do it too. That's a contender for catch of the year, man. 
Yeah, and it, it it was crazy because the one replay made it look like he was out for sure. It did. And then the other replay was like, no, no, you can see a little <laughs> bit of green there. Uh, so that was like but a heck of a catch, heck of a way to get your foot down there. And uh, yeah, I'll, and I just want to go back to that hold really quickly. That's the point in the game where it's so important that you make sure that that call is right. They yeah. should have went to the eye in the sky to look at it. But again, that's so just being a dead like, horse. The holding is not challengeable. No, I know it's not challengeable. So I don't but know like if I think, that makes it reviewable. I don't know. We don't know. We don't know what is reviewable, what's not. Sometimes <laughs> sometimes it seems like they spend 10 minutes to try to see if... I know. If uh, the line of scrimmage is correct. <laughs> like, instead of making sure that the, uh, roughing the passer is a good call or not. But... Um, yeah, no, Jalen Philpot, or I mean Tyson Philpot. No, yeah, Jalen. Yeah, like he now his brother's got to come back next week and have a better catch because that's yeah. I, I want to see that happening every week. I want to see these guys go at it like that. So look, Calgary made plays and BC really didn't make many plays. The Stanley Berry Hill touchdown was was nice, um, but the the stamps. Like Reggie Bagleton had a touchdown. Clark Barnes had a big uh, touchdown. So, so they made the plays that uh, uh, BC just couldn't. And when you can't overcome the opposing team taking that many, many penalties, uh, I, I just think it just wasn't your day. Now, yeah, and if you if you look at this or if you if you noticed, what did Jake not do that much of? He throw didn't the ball throw deep. deep. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what I said they needed to do <laughs> to be successful with Jake because he's really good at the short and intermediate routes. And so they did that. And look at the success that he had. Now, a lot of pay, plays left on the field. You could say that the Lions deserved to, you know, get back into this game and win the game. But... <laughs> The stamps also drop some interceptions as well. So it's always a shoulda, coulda, woulda thing when it comes to football. Now, TJ Lee gets back into the lineup. He makes a big stop on third and one on Mark and Michelle. Uh, so the Lions take over, you know, 109 yards to go, a chance to get in this thing. But then the holding penalty happens. <laughs> Again. I know. Again. <laughs> but, like, both teams are trying to lose. So, I I can't believe the end of this game. So, Clark Barnes has a backward, I guess, pass from Jake Mayer. It's second and 18. The, the, if the Lions stop the second and 18, well there's a good chance to get the ball back with a lot of time. Well, Calgary converts it. <laughs> and then the next play, Jalen Philpot fumbles the ball. Adrian Green forcing that fumble. Siante Evans has the biggest opportunity in the world to recover this thing with the Lions down by one at great field position. A chance to put Mr. Automatic, Sean White, and win this game. But Siante Evans with the phantom fumble. The ball is in his arms. Must have been covered in butter, man. <laughs> Just squeezed out. That hurt. So, yeah, oh. Philpot fumbles it. Evans jumps on it. I don't know the 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 when, ball forced or the ground forced them to drop the ball. Calgary gets it back and they end up running out the rest of the clock and uh, getting a victory there. Like <laughs> when you're that close to the end zone, just knock it out of bounds. Yeah. Like he was five yards from the from the or not the end zone, the sideline. Yeah. Just knock it out, and then you know for sure you don't have to worry about catching it. It's a unique rule. It's not the same in the NFL, so maybe that's one reason. But it's just like that's you can. It happens so many times just because these defensive guys aren't used to yeah, having yeah. handling the ball, and they get so excited, and it's like a like a me in front of cake, and you go <laughs> after it, and then it's like, yeah. but 
<laughs> it it was hilarious. I, I think I just I, I just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> like so, hey, the stamps win. They beat the yeah. Lions 25-24. It was one of those bizarre games where they did though honor the great Wally Buono, who remarkably has the most career franchise wins for both the Calgary Stampeders and the BC Lions. When you really think about that, that is crazy. So he gets to be on the Stampeders uh, Wall of Fame, uh, Mr. Wally Buono. Hey, now I got the BC Buono bobblehead. I need the Stampeders Buono bobblehead. I, I saw them showing off there. And, you know, Matt Dunnigan and Henoch Bwamba had nothing but glowing words to say about the godfather, uh, Wally Buono. So I think it goes without saying that, you know, that's well deserved. And, uh, yeah, he, he's one of the all time characters and greats in this league. And, uh, Hey, he, he looks like he could still, you know, Hey, that's, <laughs> and I'll he mention- did say, he did say that he would listen to, like, not for a head coach or GM, but for, like, consulting or something. He would be open to to, to working with another team. Yeah. He, but, he could be an advisor or something yeah, like advisor, that. Yeah, advisor, yeah. But also, I think... The, I think that this that the wrong place in the stadium is where his name is there. It should be on the field. Because mm. that's where he was always, he was always <laughs> on the field. I like that. I like that. Now, uh, one thing I'll mention, he, he did have the in-booth interview. I know what everybody thinks about that. I'm okay with listening to Wally Buono during a game. But while yeah. he was being interviewed, it was a 14-play, 89-yard drive that ate almost seven minutes off the clock by the Stamps. And that's the drive where Michelle got stopped on the goal line by TJ Lee. But when yeah. it's 30 degrees out and your defense is on the field for that long... That'll wear almost anybody out. I think that was a critical drive by the Stampeders, which I know at that point was a tie game. But still, uh, it, it, football can almost be like a boxing match. Those jabs and those combos just wear out a defense throughout the course of the game. And that was a critical one um, from the Stampeders, I thought. That's week seven of CFL football. I don't know. Things just keep getting crazier and crazier. But at the end of the show, I do want to uh, give our condolences uh, to the Toronto Argonauts organization and the family of Argo's legend, Peter Martin, who uh, passed away Monday morning. He played 104 career games for the Argos. He was a linebacker through the 60s and 70s, but he also was the color man on radio for more than 25 years, and he got inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame in 2000. So our condolences to the family of Peter Martin, 83 years old. Week 8 of the CFL starts on fr- Thursday. The It'll be a showdown between the Owls and the Riders. The Owls looks like they're going to be without Cody Fajardo dealing with the uh, hamstring injury. He hasn't practiced. Uh, so the Riders going on the road for that interesting game. Friday night, Stamps, Red Blacks. Saturday, uh, it'll be the Bombers and the Argos. Sunday, the Elks and uh, the Ticats. Toilet Bowl! <laughs> you can rate, review, and subscribe to Two and Out in your favorite podcatcher. And you can like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube as well. Uh, you can buy your Two and Out merch. You can support us on Patreon. You can get all that info at twoandout.ca. I'm Travis Curra. He's Sheldon Jones. We will talk to you, I guess, in a couple days <laughs> to get you ready for Week 8. Thanks for listening. Find more great shows like this at CF Pod Network on Twitter.